Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about what to do when a loved one is facing cancer. I'm honored to welcome special guest Emily Johnson. Emily is a marketing and advertising expert and the author of Bird of Paradise. You can find Emily's book on Amazon, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Emily. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I um I said you were the author and you are but you're really the co-author of this book. It yeah. is special and it has a very unique story behind it. Would you be willing to start with with that and we'll, we'll go into your story, your story sure. from there? Sure. Um yeah, well this book Bird of Paradise was actually co-authored with my mom and when I was 13 my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And fortunately, she had caught it early. She had the tumor removed and went through radiation and and life kind of went on. Um, But then a couple years later, she was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. And statistically, that's not survivable. Um, But, you know, she she refused to accept that she wasn't going to be a statistic. And she actually found some doctors willing to look at her as an individual and not as one of those you know, well, we're just going to maintain what we can and say goodbye a couple of years down the road. And when she was diagnosed, she started writing a book and she spent hours um, in her office and, and in, in her summer house by her pond writing and researching. And she never let anybody read it. She, um, I asked her several times what it was about. And she just said that I would know eventually. Um, so, you know, fast forward, believe it or not, 17 years and um, you know, this, this, you have a couple years to live turned into 17 years and she passed away in 2012, um, quite suddenly, uh, around Christmas and several weeks after she passed away, I found a letter and it was a copy of her unfinished manuscript. And in the letter, she asked me to finish it for her. Um, and so I sat down and it took me eight years to finish it. Um, I never really intended to publish it. It was, it was more of a gift for me than anything else. And then I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and a publisher read it and wanted to publish it. And now I have a published book. (laughs) That's fantastic. So it's interesting that she had two different kinds of cancer where it's that, okay, we got this and then no, there's some more to the story. So that's kind of an interesting situation. Um, Yeah, she was, she was BRCA gene positive. So with the BRCA gene, it's pretty much a guarantee of breast and or ovarian cancer. Interesting. Um, And unfortunately, that was just a genetic thing. Okay. So as I'm listening to your story, uh, it feels personal to me because I know people who are on different ends of, of, of your story. You, you had an interesting experience that in your youth, recognizing the mortality of your mother. And, and, and we're all actually mortal and, and none of us get out alive, but we don't think about it. We just figure that it goes forever. And to recognize and to realize, no, there could be an end. Well, there will be an end, but it could be any time is it, it, it changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, as a, as a child, what, what did that do to you? I mean, it's never easy at any time, but you know, when you're 13 and particularly as a girl, that's kind of, you're coming into that age where you really do need your mother and you're still young enough to think your parents are invincible and that nothing will ever happen to them. And then all of a sudden you're blindsided with, you know, the, the, you know, I still remember what I was wearing the day she told me, honey, I have breast cancer and, and this is what this means. And of course, the first thing you ask is, are you going to die? And suddenly you are faced with this real idea that your mother or loved one may not be there to see you graduate from high school or college or your wedding or, or, you know, become a grandmother. And it's, it puts everything in perspective, which is kind of cliche to say. Um, But, you know, 10 years out from, from her passing away, I can kind of look back at it now. And obviously I wish it had never happened, but also look at it as this gift that brought my family so close because I'm an only child and I had a relationship with my parents that I think is very unique. They were my best friends. You know, I spent my 21st birthday in New Orleans with my parents (laughs) and, you know, we traveled and, and we shared everything and there was this very close bond and I'm not sure 
you know, how, how would that have developed had we not had this life altering moment that she may not be here to experience everything with us? Um, you know, and so it, it, when you're 13 and again, when you're 15, which is where things really became real with the diagnosis that this is terminal, um, you, you grow up awfully fast. I mean, suddenly you're, you feel like you need to take care of your parents seeing, you know, your mother go through chemotherapy and she's not necessarily the one that is taking care of you when you're sick. You know, you have all of a sudden it's a role reversal. Um, and my mom was amazing. And then, you know, she never, given what she went through, you wouldn't always know she was sick. Um, you know, she really put everyone else first. She was, had this outlook on life that you can't control what happens in life, but you can control how you respond to it. And she was not going to respond in a way that, that was going to give up. She was going to fight for as long as she possibly could. And cancer was not allowed to rule our, our household. Wow. I, I, I appreciate you bringing up the positives and the negatives that it, it affected the way that your family dynamics worked. I have another friend, he has cancer and he said it, it changed his world where, you know, before he was just, I am going to make the most money, my career, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And after the diagnosis, he realized my time is limited. I have little kids. I have a wife. This is the most important thing. This is what matters. When, when I'm done, this is what matters. And it, it shifted everything. And he's uh, one of my husband's coworkers. And he said he's one of his favorite people because he is so special in the way that he sees things and the way that he, I, I don't know, but you mentioned the perspective, just the way that, mm -hmm. the way that he lives, the, what matters. And, um, and then, and then on the, the negative side, uh, I don't, did your mom, did she have energy? Was she struggling with chemo? What? She, you know what? She was pretty amazing because it was about 15 years of chemotherapy okay. um, on and off. She had, I think went through eight reoccurrences with major surgeries and, and lots and lots of chemo. And she really combined Western and Eastern medicine. She um, did a lot with acupuncture, a lot with herbs. Her doctors kind of worked in conjunction with an acupuncturist. And, you know, with the exception of a few times that I can remember, and then, you know, the typical hair loss and things like that, you really couldn't tell she was on chemotherapy. The, really? Um, yeah. I mean, she just, she never fully, you know, unless she really hid it from me and she did a great job of it. She, I don't remember her spending days, you know, being sick or, you know, you could see her energy level changed a little bit, but she was still out there, you know, doing what she does and, and doing what she loved and spending time with her friends. And we were on the golf course and, um, she did amazingly well, given how much chemotherapy she had to go through. Um, and That's then amazing. ironically, I think it was the years of chemotherapy that finally caught up to her. Um, so she did actually, you know, she said she was never going to pass away from cancer. And in the end, she didn't. It was kidney failure from the years and years of chemotherapy she had to go through. Interesting. That is interesting. So, um, I, I, again, I have a, another dear friend and neighbor who currently has cancer. She's been battling it for years. And her children, her youngest, can't ever remember a time when his mother wasn't sick. And and it has affected her her energy levels and some of the things that they can do. And um but I believe it it gives the kids again that reality check and also uh some compassion and a different way of, of looking at things. So wow. Well, I appreciate you being willing to finish your mom's story. And it's interesting that you knew that it had a purpose for you, for healing you and making that, that connection and being able to, um, uh, come to a, a, a closure, I guess, with your mother. Yeah. But it's I mean, beyond is, that. Well, the book is really, um, you know, it's fictional. So, you know, and it, it follows a, a young girl at the beginning, she's 17. So it's kind of a coming of age, but it grows over a 10 year period with her. as She's finding herself in the world and who she's meant to be. 
And it, it leads her to, um, you know, one of life's most beautiful journeys of, of finding the love of her life. And, you know, so well, these characters don't really exist. There is a lot of my mother in them in that there's a lot of the dynamic between the mother and the girl in it. It's a lot of life lessons, a lot of guidance through certain parts of her life and a, a lot of wisdom that a mother would want to pass down to their child. And so I think my mom intentionally did that because she didn't know if she'd be here at every stage of my life to pass that wisdom on to me and to guide me through it and hold my hand. And so this book was a way of doing it. It was almost like a roadmap just in case she wasn't here to do part of that. And there is a very black and white place where she ended it and I had to take over from there. And, and I had to, you know, just from writing technique had to go back to what she had written and make sure that the story arc made sense and that where I took it would connect. And so I had to change things and add things to where, you know, to her part as well. So it was a 50, 50 collaboration in the end, but I think she intentionally left off at a certain spot in this book, knowing that I would need it, um, you know, it, to make it through after, after she passed away, it was a way of continuing a conversation with her, um, you know, for eight years that I, I felt like I could talk to her. I felt like through these characters, we were talking to one another and I tried very hard to carry that idea through as, you know, as almost like a legacy because I have a seven-year-old son and this is kind of my way of putting into words the things, you know, that I want him to know and, and the stories of our family that, you know, are, are little Easter eggs through it that nobody else would really get, you know, but, but still work for the story. And um, I mean, I have no intention of going where anytime soon, but you never know. And so it was very therapeutic for me to finish this, um, you know, and then at the end, I was kind of sad because I felt like I was closing a chapter on my life where I wasn't going to have my mom to talk to again. And then it got published and now I've been marketing it and I've been talking on podcasts and people have been reaching out to me about the book and about the story behind it. So I almost figure like I'm in a new phase of having a discussion with my mom because I get to carry on her work. That is beautiful. And isn't it interesting that your stories have layers? You have the story behind the book, which includes the story of you and the story of your mother. And then the fictional story that you created. And isn't it beautiful that we can learn from each other's stories, whether they are real or whether they are fictional? The stories are what help us to be able to make those uh, connections. And sometimes it's, you, you can tell me something and it might just go, woo. But if it's in a story form, then somehow things start to make sense. It does. I think, you know, apart from, I mean, it's obviously very personal to me and means a lot to me on a very deep level because it's my mom. And I, I remember having some conversations with my mom. I remember the advice she gave me that got woven into this story, but for somebody that's not connected to it, like I am, it's still, you know, something that can really be related to. I mean, I think we've all gone through some of the moments in this character's life, you know, where, where things are absolutely wonderful or things are, you know, so-and-so said something to you at school and you never want to go back again. You know, we all <laughs> kind of had that. And so I think it's very relatable as well. And it, the book takes place, it starts in 1967 in San Francisco, which is when my mom was growing up in San Francisco. She was a high school senior then. And so even for, you know, the whole book expands through 10 years. So it can also be relatable. There's a lot of detail about things that were going on in places and faces that were in there that, you know, can, it's, you can reminisce about it quite a bit. That sounds fantastic. So I have a question about, about the writing style, because you're probably have a different writing style than your mom. Uh, yesterday I had an opportunity, my mom was writing some things and it, it needed some tweaking. So I worked with it. And by the time I was done, it didn't look anything like what it started. So how, how did, how did that work out? was interesting because for marketing and advertising my writing style is very to the point um you know get things across in as few words as possible because that that's just what the industry is and my mom's writing style was very descriptive you know very poetic and you know detailed and so I was determined that this was her book and it would be her book through the end so I needed to follow her writing style and her sentence structure and just the level of research she put into things 
And so um, I think that's part of what took me so long was, you know, it, coming up with the story was not that hard. She left no notes, but all the characters were developed except for one. And I knew the name of that character and I knew who that character was supposed to be. But um, apart from that, you know, she left it open for me to take it where I wanted to take it. And that wasn't the hard part. What was hard was from there going back and making sure I put layer upon layer of detail into it so that you couldn't tell where she left off and I began. Um, and what was the first view of it versus what I, it is now, you couldn't even tell. It's the same thing. You know, it, it really... Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm very proud of the fact that nobody's really been able to tell where, where that break happened. Um, it's wow. been something that was a real goal of mine. That is quite a success story for you among all your other successes <laughs> that you were able to uh, continue the voice of your mother. And that way, like you mentioned, there, there's these closing of chapters of things are changing in your life. Because you were able to continue that voice, you always have the voice of your mother. And it's funny because that's kind of um, a theme throughout the book a little bit because that was so personal to me and that's what it was for me. I, I wrote that in, in a way, into the story of the book, you know, about the idea of, you know, that, that life is a series of chapters, you know, and that each chapter, when it closes, another one starts. And, you know, and that's, that's you know, it's about being in the present but and, and looking toward the future, but never looking in the past learning how to, how to overcome that and be present. Um, you know, and there was a lot, a lot of me in this book, a lot of emotions I was working through, um, got written into the story as well. Um, and so I think, you know, that, that helped me write in a sense, because if I hadn't had any personal feelings about it, if it had been a story I couldn't relate to with the differences in our writing styles, I'm not sure I could have pulled it off. That is really, really cool. What a lovely thing. And I also love the idea as you're bringing this coming of age story, which is a very popular kind of topic because it applies to every person. We all come of age, but a lot of them, when they get to that point, there's kind of a, a almost a, a divorce from family. It's like, okay, hey, now I'm coming of age, which means I am my own person and parents are, you know, we pretend that they don't exist. And it sounds like you're including the wisdom and a relationship as part of that. And I, I really love that because I believe that we need our parents as long as we have them. Well, and this is definitely, I mean, it is, it, everyone tries to put it into a genre, but like I said, it's a coming of age family saga romance. Romance. But, you know, it, it does evolve with the character in it, but there is that very close family bond in it. And it's very much based on the bond I had with my family. Um, and, you know, I, I can see that. I can see, you know, just the, the, the level of wisdom that I may not really have understood when I was younger, but looking back on it and now being a mother myself, I get it. You know, all of a sudden it was that aha moment. I know what she was talking about back then, but you know, it was, she was adamant that her cancer not really, you know, affect things too much. And I, I used to, you know, I had the typical teenage moments where I would fight my parents and I would, you know, throw a little bit of an attitude. Well, a lot of an attitude, let's face it all in a minute, but you know, and my mom, you know, but then I would immediately say, Oh, I'm so sorry, mom, you know, and, and be like in perspective and there's bigger things, you know, you, you're sick and, and I shouldn't be feeling this. And she, she would always look at me and just be like, what are you talking about? You have every right to be upset over this just because I have cancer doesn't mean, you know, what's happening to you with a friend at school should be belittled. And, you know, and, and, and I didn't understand that, you know, back then until I had to go through growing up the loss of my mother and now becoming a mom myself, it kind of all makes sense. Um, the approach she took to it and the things she told me. Your mother sounds like an incredibly wise woman. And as she I'm was. listening to your story and you say, you know, I shouldn't be feeling that way, that, that just hit me because we are allowed to feel our feelings and to have someone say you shouldn't feel that way 
is, is very painful and confusing as we're trying to work through the feelings that we have. And so for her to be that wise and to be able to allow you to be a human, and I cannot say that the cancer did not affect you because uh-huh. it did, but I think it, it didn't, um, that she made it as positive an experience as you could under the circumstances, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, she did. And she, you know, she put her family first regardless. I mean, there was times where she held back news because either it wasn't definitive about what the result was going to be, or there was a family trip coming up and she did not want to mar those memories with either unnecessary worry or, you know, the fact that when we got back from that trip, we were going to be going through a whole new round of this happening again. And she often, for some reason, (laughs) seemed to get her, her, um, her reoccurrences right before my final exams in high school and college. Dang it. I don't know why, um, like exams aren't bad enough as it is, but she was an educator. Um, and so it wasn't unusual for her to be 48 hours outside of surgery, hooked up to an IV full of chemotherapy with my textbook on her lap as I paced back and forth. And she quizzed me to make sure that I did not, you know, fail my exams. It was not, cancer was not an excuse that I could use for anything. And she, I knew how, I don't know, angry isn't the right word, but I knew how um, disappointed she would be if I let her cancer win by using it as an excuse not to excel. Um, You know, she didn't push me. She wasn't a pushy mother or anything, but she also did not want to her that was losing to cancer if it affected me to the point where my grades suffered or my friendship suffered or, or my life in general just wasn't you know, as full as it could be. That is fascinating. The way that you put the idea of losing to cancer was not about life or death. It was about the way that it affected the people that she loves. And yeah, I mean, you just, you can't let it, you know, it's life changing enough as it is, but you know, it's, it wins you know, cancer will win in a lot of different ways above and beyond the actual medical, you know, issues with it. I mean, if it, if it becomes something that, you know, you stop living day to day because of it, it's one, you know, and that was very much um, something she focused on because she was just, she was very stubborn and she just looked cancer right in the face. And and she just said, you're never going to beat me. It's not going to happen. And she, she was right. She did everything. She fought every single day, you know, to make sure, um, you know, that she, she never lost to it. And there was long periods of time where, you know, I knew she had cancer. It was always there in the back of my mind. Every time she had a checkup, you know, it was a little nerve wracking because you never know what news you're going to get. But there was huge periods of time where I didn't even think about it from day to day because of the way she was. It wasn't something where every day on my shoulders was my mom has cancer and we've done this and we have to do this. There was plenty of time growing up where I didn't have to think about it. And that's really special. And I think that's another, you know, win for her and a loss for the cancer. That is absolutely beautiful. Do you have any advice or words of wisdom for someone who is going through this situation, whether they are the child of a parent or the parent who is who is the, 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 the one with the cancer? I mean, it's, you know, it, it's not my advice, but it's my mom's example. Um, you know, in the way she, she just looked at every day, like a new opportunity to create a memory of something and to find, you know, what she called sanctuary, which was, you know, that place where you know who you are and you like what you know. And, you know, to find the passion, you know, and saying to live each day to the fullest is kind of cliche because she had days where she just got mad at the whole situation. But it was being able to look, you know, not into the future of the what if, but it's the what is the possibility and, you know, not to dwell on it, because when you dwell on it, it gets so it's so self-destructive at that point. And, and then past that, you know, losing somebody is probably where I have more of my advice because I went, you know, grief is not, it, you cannot prescribe how you go through grief. There is no, you know, by X date, you have to be in this, this place. And by this date, everybody's different. My dad and I approached it very differently. You know, I still have issues with it 10 years, you know, 
out where all of a sudden it will hit me or all of a sudden something will happen. My, my child will sneeze and I want to call my mom right away to make sure I don't take him to the hospital. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's very, you know, it's very hard, but I think kind of one of the overall things that I learned and something that I think my mom would have really, really wanted me to learn how to deal with is the guilt. It is such a, um, destructive feeling because it's na- it's natural you know instantly after she passed away and I got past that stage of taking care of bank accounts and letting people know and all that kind of stuff you know and once the casseroles ended and everyone went back to their lives as they will the guilt set in and all of a sudden I remembered these moments where I had been a typical teenager or I had said something or she wanted to get together and I had plans with friends and so I said no I'm busy and then all of a sudden you think oh my gosh, you know, did she know I loved her? I can't believe I said that to her or, you know, just in, in realizing that that she's not going to think that she, you know, she knew I loved her and those little moments, the guilt's unnecessary. And I think, I think that's really important because of all the emotions you feel guilt is the one that's going to be the most destructive. Interesting. And I'm sure that she wouldn't want you to feel guilty. I'm quite sure no. that she knew that you loved her. No, and, loved and it her. goes back to the same thing of her telling me it was okay to feel things, even if in the big picture they weren't that important, you know, not to feel guilty that I was upset about something. Um, and I really appreciated that you mentioned that your mother on, on occasions would be angry at the situation. Mm-hmm. And I, I am so grateful that you brought that up because she is so wise and she did it so well. And I don't want anyone who's listening to think, well, I'm not handling my challenges like that. I, I get mad sometimes. I get frustrated sometimes. I, I, I'm not perfect. And to recognize that we don't have to be perfect to, to be good enough, to be able to handle those challenges in a way that, you know, your daughter comes and says, wow, what an example, what a story, what a, and, and her story continues to bless and inspire people even after her life ended. And so I, I do, I really appreciate you including that. So thank you. And And nobody's perfect. I mean, I can, I can say that, you know, I've learned to look at it as a positive, you know, way and that I, I, but there's moments where I relive the last few days, you know, when she was on life support and it's a negative, bad place to go. And it's thinking about the past, not the present. And, and, but it happens and it's okay. You know, and there's, and, and I, you know, and during, like I said, during the time that she was alive, man, she, she had moments where she just emotionally couldn't handle it and she let herself feel it, you know, and she wasn't a, she was a very optimistic person, but she wasn't what she referred to as a perky Peggy. (laughs) She didn't, she didn't like the internally perky people, (laughs) you know, and, and because she said sometimes it's just you know, well, I can't repeat what she used to say, on the podcast, but you can kind of get it. You know, sometimes it just sucks, you know, and it's okay to think that. Um, it doesn't mean you're not doing it right or you're giving up to think that it's just what it is. And you just have to forgive yourself, you know, everybody, whether you're the patient or you're the loved one, or you're just grieving somebody that has just passed away. You just have to learn to forgive yourself. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for visiting with me today. I feel like this is going to be very applicable to a lot of people. Well, I I hope so, because it's, it's such a surprise where this book took me by being able to talk about my experience. And I find myself talking a lot more about the backstory than the book itself. Um, And that was a shocker to me when people started reaching out with their own personal stories about dealing with cancer and losing a parent. Um, and to me, I think that's almost as much of a gift as having this book, you know, left to me by my mom. It's continuing her, her legacy, um, and hoping that, you know, how she handled it and things that I learned from it can help somebody else going through the same thing. And that's what we're all about. That's why we're here today is to help and lift each other. So again, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Joseph Campbell. He said, You have to be willing to give up the life you planned and instead greet the life that is waiting for you. 
Today, I invite you to greet the life that is waiting for you, even if it's not the one you planned. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.